I am super excited to be here. Um, I found this, I've been here uh, five years ago, I came to speak, and uh, I spoke about simplicity, um, and nobody listened, because it's, it's, everything's so complicated now. <laughs> oh, you, he listened, right there. But even Mark didn't listen. I mean, the, you know, he keeps adding all kinds of shit to the stage. It's like he got it from some warehouse somewhere or something. But um, I'm super excited to be here. It's a, it's a really special conference. It's, it's kind of special to have 500 people in a room, and it kind of feels like a family. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm speaking, but when I'm out there talking to people and I love these long breaks, it's just a... It's a different feeling than I've had pretty much at any conference, so i um, super happy to be here. I hope I can contribute something that you could find useful um, uh, as you leave here. So I work at a bank. I'm a creative director at a bank, um, and a lot of people uh, ask me, why did you do that? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, why would you work at a bank? Uh, well, not all of us have cool jobs like, like Mike Hill. You know, We don't all work for Netflix and all that. So it, we, have, we have boring jobs, non-sexy jobs, and actually we need to do that. I'm just kidding, Mike, wherever you are. But uh, banks, you know, everyone has a bank. So I think some of us have to go in there and shake that stuff up, right? So that's what we're trying to do. I've only been there four months. But then people say, why didn't you choose a bank that people know? <laughs> you know? No one knows this bank outside of Holland. You might know them because they had a cycling team, I think till 2012. This is me before stress curled my hair. <laughs> and uh, no, I think it's, it's Eric Decker. And I guess he's a famous cyclist. I don't know because I really don't like cycling. And I, don't, I don't care, actually. Um, I also wrote a book called Responsive Design Workflow, and even though it's kind of an old book now and some of it's a little bit outdated, uh, a lot of the principles in there are, are still valid. This is, the, this is the Chinese translation of the book. I was surprised that they, I didn't know that they translated that into Chinese, so, and I don't think I got any royalties for it. Um, but I'm happy they did it because in China, as opposed to in Europe and the US, they appreciate the wisdom of old people like myself. So, um, I want to talk a bit about constraints. I feel like, I feel like that when Charlie started talking about constraints and as we went throughout the day, I was like, well, you know, everybody's pretty much talking about constraints. And if you do any kind of design or you do development or basically work of any kind, you're talking about constraints. Um, Charlie set the tone talking about constraints. Brendan, if you look at those graphics that he did, that's, um, I see that almost as different layers of the same thing. So it's kind of, I mean, maybe it's like art bullshit that you say after the fact, but these layers, the, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll help you out here. <laughs> That, so he constrained himself with these shapes, with, uh, with a color palette, um, and he created the variation with the specific colors and the, and the movements, but all these things were kind of layered on top of each other, so there was kind, it's kind of like different speakers, different topics, but they all have an overarching theme, so I thought it fit pretty well. Um, Carolyn gave an example of uh, specific constraints and how constraints can help you with documentation. Uh, Mike giving the example of constraints of storytelling and how you can use that both for, for good and evil. Um, I think Red, uh, her talk was really, uh, to me, it seemed like she was uh, trying to rediscover or discover new constraints or and maybe even um, new parts of herself with every single project and just kind of creating new constraints to, to explore different areas of you know, what, what she could accomplish. Um, David, <laughs> the, the constraints of, you know, not surfing where rocks are, uh, <laughs> which I learned my lesson. I'm never going to do that now. <laughs> the, the funny thing was, I, I talked to him afterward, and David, are you here anywhere? No? Okay. Not yet. Um, you're missing the best talk. <laughs> okay, so if you see the video. But the thing was, he showed the toe, which was pretty shocking to me anyway. But then uh, afterward, he just somehow felt the need to show that toe from a different perspective. <laughs> so I, 
I don't know. I, I like David a lot. Um, Rob, the constraints that he had when doing graffiti, which is uh, coincidentally how, how I got into design myself, uh, was the, through graffiti as a teenager. Um, Rob took those constraints that he had, like taking the picture, moving on, and he just applied that throughout every other thing that he ever did. So these are kind of constraints that become almost principles for the way, uh, the way that he works. And David challenged our ideas of, um, you know, where, where are constraints? Where are those constraints? Maybe we don't know where they end. Maybe there are different sets and we don't, we don't know. So we can go out and we can explore those things. So in a sense, all of this has to do with constraints. And I thought that was a, um, a good thread throughout, throughout the day yesterday. And I, I have the feeling we'll find that thread throughout today as well. So, Let's talk about some uh, painful questions that we have as designers. Do we have designers here? Yeah? Developers will have the same problem. So there are a lot of designers here, but um, come on, give me, give me some annoying questions that people ask you as designers. Call one out. Make the logo bigger. Make the logo bigger. That's a classic one, yes. Anyone else? Yeah, there's some white space. Got to fill up the white space. <laughs> Don't say that to David. Can we use Comic Sans? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you probably could. Yeah. So these kind of questions, these are, they seem like innocent questions. But after a while, if you've been working in design for many, many years, in, in an industry where whatever, whatever you do, just because people have an opinion about it, they feel like they can do the same thing that you can. It's just that they didn't ta waste their time to get a formal education about it. So it's pretty, it's a, it's a terribly masochistic career choice uh, to be a designer. Why would you do that to yourself, <laughs> you know? So th this is a question that I actually uh, get a lot uh, against uh, another question, which is, um, oh, we saw one of our competitors doing this, can we do the same thing? As if doing exactly what your competitor does is a good marketing strategy. But this thing, literally, there was a, a member of my team at my previous uh, employer, and there was, they got a, a JIRA ticket, and the, the ticket was a, a design ticket, so they had to do this design for a particular um, flow. And all there was in the ticket, there was no description, uh, there was just a screenshot of Airbnb, of this part of Airbnb where the, the PO was like, uh, that's a product owner, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar. The product owner said, um, well, they just had the screenshot, so they didn't say anything actually, but what was implied is uh, make something and do it just like Airbnb did. So that is just, oh, I'm sorry, that is ridiculous. <laughs> Somehow, everyone seems to think that everyone else is doing it better than we are, right? The grass is always greener or redder <laughs> on the other side. And uh, why? Why is that? If we think that, then what, what is going on on the web? All, everything is the same. And we've been talking about this for years. So the same people who say, oh, I'm tired of everything being the same, they're like, oh, we can't do things differently because conventions, you know, this is how everybody does it. Therefore, users understand it. Therefore, it must be good. And we come to conferences like this, and who are we inspired by? The people who do that? No. We're inspired by the people who do these things that we wish we could do. If we, if we only had the, the space and the, the freedom to do that within our jobs, well, hopefully, I'll be able to challenge some of you here today to, to realize that you can, you can start to do that kind of thing, um, even in a bank. So this is another example of, uh, some of you probably have, have watched the show Silicon Valley, so you recognize this. This is a fake website, and I think it's a kind of an older screenshot, but it was, it, I laughed and laughed when I saw this. It's just so hilarious. There are so many things that are identical to almost every single website out there. It's like there's only one framework. I don't even understand why we have more than one person in our industry. <laughs> so this phenomenon is so prevalent that even a television show makes fun of it, right? That's crazy. 
So what is that about conventions? We think, oh, these three columns, you know, every, people understand this, um, and we tell ourselves these stories about uh, this kind of thing. But um, we rely on conventions because we think they'll give us a solution, an acceptable solution, with a minimum of, of effort. Daniel Kahneman uh, has said that the brain is a machine for jumping to conclusions. And uh, these kind, you know, it's the same thing with cognitive biases. These things are, um, your brain does things to make it easier so you don't have to think about it um, all the time. But sometimes as a designer, you, you kind of want to break that, that process. Um, so when non-designer stakeholders mention these things, they're focusing on solutions, right? They, they've seen something in the wild and they're like, well, uh, maybe we can apply that to our own particular problem. So the classic example of a convention that uh, has <laughs> spurred all kinds of arguments is the, the hamburger menu, um, which you can only, I, I think we had a conversation here with someone and they said, yeah, but no one knows it's called a hamburger menu unless they work you know, on the web or in, in, in mobile. And that's true. And, and people say, well, why do they call it that? Of course, because it, it's, it's like a hamburger. And it's kind of ironic that the hamburger menu is named after something that contains meat when the navigation that we had like way back in the day was called mystery meat navigation. So this is the, the website for, or a screen, very, very poor screenshot of um, the website for The Matrix, the, film, the first film, The Matrix. And you didn't really know what was uh, behind these things. You just kind of had to hover above them and then, and then click on them and you'd, you'd find out uh, what was behind it. And we called this mystery meat navigation, but now we have it again. <laughs> this is, the, we basically said, okay, do we, can we find another kind of meat? <laughs> and can we name some kind of uh, icon after it? There's literally, uh, there's probably an icon for every single type of food there is that somehow relates to navigation. Um, so uh, the double hamburger menu, which I, I don't understand, but somehow we, we feel like the hamburger menu is, is easier to understand than any of these other uh, particular options. And it could be true. It could be true because we use it so often. But the argument has been used even in the very beginning because of who was using this. Facebook at the time. And Facebook at one point had three different uh, hamburger menus. So really all it says is there's something here and you should tap or click on me to find out what that something is. Um, and it saves space. So you have to wonder, what are you optimizing for here? Are you optimizing for that people will understand what this means? If you see this anywhere on a given site, you might think you know what, you means, what it means, but you, you won't know until you actually click on it, unless there's some kind of text explaining what's behind there. So you just never, never know for sure. So what we've done is we've made a convention for the form, but we haven't made a convention for, for the content, or we haven't tied the form and the content together, which actually is uh, was uh, Paul Rand's definition of design. So if we use these conventions, we're, we're picking things, we see things in the wild that we're picking, what, there's some part of us, at least some of us, who thinks, well, there was someone at some point, there was a point of origin where maybe different industries influenced this person or some, some kind of influences. In any case, not anything that was out there. And uh, they put these things together, they looked at their problem, and they came up with a solution, and now this is the solution that everyone else is looking at. I always wanted to be that point of origin, you know, the, the person who thought of that. Because there was always one. It's not that there was, like, in the beginning, there was a hamburger menu. That's, that's not how, uh, how the world works. So we're developing expertise in choosing rather than in thinking. And the most valuable thing that any of us here uh, can do is think. That's how we provide actual value. Execution is a question of learning something, and it could be hard, it could be easy, um, but you learn it and you execute it. But thinking about that solution is really, really, really hard work. That's the hard work of design. So as choosers of existing solutions, we're not the ones thinking up the solutions to choose from, and I think it's really cool to aspire to be that. Now, I'm not saying that, no conven that all conventions are bad. I'm not saying that things haven't been tested and they're kind of um, 
you know, tried and true, and, and you can use those and, and have reasonable expectations of the, the outcome. Um, but we should always think about, uh, is that the case? Can we challenge that? Because that's part of our job as well, is to, to think critically about these things. So who remembers, who's old enough <laughs> to remember this campaign? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I don't feel that old. Think different. Remember the colored logo? Remember that? Apple, um, at the time, now it's, most designers, I would say, uh, assume that everyone has an iPhone, right? But that's, that wasn't always the case. Um, I've used Apple computers since the Apple IIe, and that was in a like, special temperature controlled room at school. <laughs> You know, you had to get special permission to go in there, and it was always locked, and there was like a pretty big room, about half the size of this stage, and then a desk and the Apple IIe <laughs> right there. So it was amazing. But there, were, there was a reputation that Apple had for making really, really uh, good hardware that was, that was different than anyone else's. And when this campaign came out, they, they pulled all these icons, uh, Pablo Picasso and, and others, and um, as examples of people who thought differently and like you would be thinking different by, by choosing Apple products. I, I don't think they'd be able to make the same claim today, but um, this was a really, uh, it was a campaign that shook things up. So they were kind of different in a fundamental way. So what we sometimes try to do is be different by imitating people who are different. So w there was a, uh, when, when David Carson, for example, first started doing um, his, you know, chopping text up and playing with space and, and type and things like that, there, were, there was a whole slew of designers who started doing kind of the, the same thing, but there was no, their, their own personality wasn't in there. Their, the, you couldn't see what the problem was that they were, they were solving. And that was pure imitation in, in many cases. And, um, I think what Rob showed which, uh, yesterday, where he was influenced by David Carson, that's, influ that's obviously influenced by, but it, it's a completely different kind of work, and uh, especially in the sense that you could actually read it. Um, the, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but the, the pure imitations mean nothing, but uh, David's work meant something in that sense. And I'll, I'll come back to David a, a little bit, because um, there's a a special uh, relationship, I guess, that, um, that I have with his work that, that he doesn't even really know about. Um, but nothing exciting happens in the comfort zone. You know, there's, there's the, you have your comfort zone, and really, as long as you're in it, um, everything is bland, and you're just gonna be doing kind of the same old thing. If you get too far outside of it, uh, there's, there's a huge chance of failure. There's also a chance of success, but the, the idea is to just constantly go right to the edge of the comfort zone and kind of push the envelope and see how far can I go. So that kind of relates to flow um, that uh, Charlie was talking about yesterday. Um, you, you get into a flow state when something is challenging enough that you're not really comfortable with it, but it's not so challenging that you'll just give up on it altogether. So the, the thing that, um, when I was in college, I came across uh, the work of, of this guy, David Carson, and uh, one of the, I was so surprised when I saw that he was going to be here. He was literally, uh, I probably wouldn't even be giving this talk today if it wasn't for David Carson's work, um, which kind of freaked me out a little bit when I, when I saw he was gonna be here. It wasn't the work itself. I didn't, it didn't influence the way, uh, like visually the way I worked. But it's more the, the, the gigantic middle finger that he gave to um, the constraints of the time, the constraints of what are you supposed to do with a page? What are you supposed to do with a grid? What are you supposed to do with a headline? How are you supposed to deal with the photography? Um, he was like, I don't care about any of that. I'm just going to, I'm going to see what happens. I'm going to look at the problem. I'm going to look at the content and I'm going to see what happens uh, with it. And this inspired me uh, to no end. I just, uh, I couldn't believe it. It reminded me of uh, the work of an artist that I uh, really admired at the time, David Sally. And it was kind of like, okay, I found this equivalent of someone like David Sally in the, 
you know, the way they, they work visually in the design world. And I, I studied both di design and uh, art, so I was schooled as a painter and a graphic designer. And uh, this was like a perfect uh, thing for me. This, this is where I started to question all the, the rules of, of things without, ten, without being super rebellious. It's just a, a healthy questioning, I think, of, of things. So, and other, other people have questioned uh, what you can do. You know, what are the, what are the rules about any given industry? Now, who's driven a Tesla? There's a few of you. Okay. It's really interesting <laughs> to drive a Tesla. It's a car, right? So it's not that Elon Musk thought, hey, um, you know, let's, uh, it's electric, let's make a spaceship out of it. It's just a car, it has wheels and everything, but when you get into it, it's like, uh, it's like an iPad with wheels. There's this, the dashboard is this kind of huge touchscreen, and there's nothing in it, there's no motor, there's no engine in there, so you kind of have two trunks to put your stuff in, and it's so weird. It's such a new experience that when I got to drive uh, a Tesla, I almost killed myself, the owner, and my oldest son, uh, who were in the car with me, because it's basically an automatic transmission, and I forgot, you know, I'm used to driving a, a stick shift with, with a clutch, so I, you know, we're driving, and I thought, oh, okay, I'll clutch. There is no clutch, that's the brake. <laughs> so I can tell you that when you're going 80 kilometers, or na kilometers an hour, the Tesla has really good brakes, and <laughs> if you don't have your seatbelt on, you are going to die and everyone who's in the car with you. And, um, and that almost happened, except we had the seatbelts on, luckily. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing, and it's really, really quiet. Um, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of this is, uh, you know, it's kind of like going right outside to the edge of the comfort zone. We're not gonna turn this into something that looks really super weird. People recognize this as a car, but there's a lot of different stuff in there. There's stuff that um, not is only, it's not only applicable to the, the auto industry, but to, to many different things, as we know, if we look at what uh, Tesla's been doing with, with energy in, in general, um, without it making any value judgments about that. But um, not everyone is this original. Sometimes there's this insidious uh, kind of uh, copying that happens. And Spencer Chen, who I'm, I'm not sure if he still is, but at the time, the marketing uh, director at Alibaba uh, wrote this tweet that nothing is original. And so when I talk about not, uh, when I talk about doing things that no one else has done, I don't mean that you're the first person who ever thought of something like that. That kind of originality is really, really rare. But usually you're taking elements from, from different things that you've seen and learned, um, different parts of your, uh, your background, your upbringing, and everything you know, and you're applying that to something. So it, it feels like an original, it's an, a new work in a sense. Um, so if we look at these two, <laughs> And you might be surprised to know the, the right-hand side is a, a city in Germany, and that's their identity from 1971. And uh, to the left is a Japanese company in 1975. Yeah. So we, I'm not saying what happened. You know, I don't know what happened here. But these, this is what Spencer uh, Chen um, tweeted, these two examples. And these are from a book that was published in the 80s with all kinds of logo types. So you can ask yourself how much is really original. And David uh, Carson, uh, he alluded to this yesterday, that if you've ever done print design, then you know that a, a popular pastime is going through the design annuals, all these competitions that designers have, and you go through and you see you know, what people have done. And a really good way to come up with work very quickly is to go back several years, see if there's something that's uh, a little bit timeless, and see if you can apply that to your own work. So I'm not saying that's what happened here, but uh, it does show you that, um, that ideas are, are kind of, uh, they kind of converge and it's, it's pretty easy to, to follow in someone else's footsteps. And we do that with the web as well. Why do all websites look the same on a website that looks exactly the same as every other website? <laughs> you know, and uh, React thought, well, you know, we can do that, we'll do it something like that. Um, to their credit, to their defense, I mean, the React people are developers, so you don't expect a, a heavy duty design from them. So that, that's fine, you know, um, not everyone's a designer. Uh, Stripe kind of shook things up a little bit with their design. They have all kinds of little design tricks 
in there. Um, they started playing around with what can, what can we do with CSS in a, in a commercial site. And uh, then uh, Netlify kind of started playing around with something that, that seems very similar. And this is not bad, it's not copying, it's just that we see how things can, you can become influenced by something that you've seen. And then we have uh, agency websites, which always tend to be a little bit weirder, a little bit um, uh, grid-oriented as well. Uh, Sagmeister and Walsh, in this case. And um, you, this bottom part with these tiles, that, that scrolls above the photo, so on top of the photo, it's kind of layered. Um, and then we have uh, another agency that, that's doing pretty much exactly the same thing. So uh, chicken and egg, we don't know. We don't know where that comes from. But so even agencies that are creative and you hire them to do the most creative work for you, they're inspired themselves by, by other people, as we, as we can see. But my work, no, I, we have to base it on conventions. You know, we've tested this with five people in a usability lab. We know that it works, it's good, right? Yeah, that's what a lot of people say. Um, I've hung around with enough data scientists to, to kind of get an itch when people say that because I'm thinking, well, you should probably just make it and put it out there and then also get some quantitative data about that and then they look at me like I have two heads and they're not always happy with that kind of thing. Um, but it's a little bit too easy to say, I have something, we're going to test it with a few users and then we're going to see um, if they like it and then we assume that that's good because we don't... There are so many factors that uh, contextually lead to whether something works or not. It's the specific people, it's the environment, it's um, you know, the time of day. There are so many different things. So you, it's really, really hard to say that, and it's really, really hard to, um, to have an argument about that when, when someone read an article on Nielsen, Nielsen, uh, Norman Nielsen you know, saying, all you need is five users to test whatever, and then you're good. So, and, and whether that's valid or not, the fact is that it's not questioned. And I think we should question that because who is someone else to tell us that how many people you need to test your thing in your specific situation and know whether it's successful. Even though it might be true much of the time, it might not be true all of the time. So the problem that I have with uh, following convention without questioning is that you don't learn. And learning is the only way we grow. So Neville Brody once said, there's no such thing as bad design, there's only inappropriate design. And in a way, maybe that's, maybe that's true. You know? Um, with appropriate design, you get some creative wiggle room in there. And with convention, you just pick it up, put it down, paste it in, you're done. You, you avoid the hard work of design, which is, which is the thinking. So this is what I told my clients back when I, was, uh, um, when I had my company, stop focusing on the solution. I don't, even, I don't want to hear a solution. I want to spend like uh, an hour right now just talking about problems. And it's just, it is so hard. If you want to try that out, go to a meeting and then just um, ban all solutions. No one's allowed to talk about a solution. It, it takes like 30 seconds. Someone's like, oh, we could do, <laughs> you know. It happens all the time. It's so hard not to think of solutions. You know, they pop up. But the problem is with solutions that the, the low-hanging fruit of creativity are the first like 100 or so solutions that you, that you get. And all of the web, basically, like 98% of it is the low-hanging fruit of creativity. Those are the solutions that people could come up with. Like grids, you know, grids have been around forever and ever and ever, a long, long time, but now that we've discovered them within the context of the web, it's like 12 column grid, you know? So why? Well, because it's easy, you know, because you can, because it's scalable and it's maintainable and all these kind of things. But we need to focus a lot more on the problem. So um, here's this kind of model. I, I tried to map out how I think about this in, in my head. I wish I could like copyright this. It, it, when I was doing this, it made me think of a story. I saw Jeffrey Zeldman uh, at a conference once, and he was talking about Ethan Marcotte. When Ethan was coming up with responsive design, he was thinking about uh, these, uh, these principles that ended up 
being called responsive design. He was like, what should I call this? And Jeffrey thought about it and he said, I think you should call it Zeldman design. <laughs> so can you imagine that we would all be, uh, hey, do you do Zeldman design? Yeah, I do. I do Zeldman design. I want something like that. I need to like put my name on this and brand it or something. Um, I don't know, I'm just desperate for money. <laughs> But this is, this is kind of the process that I follow, and maybe some of you will find it useful. It's basically on the left side you have these actions, things you can do on the right side are these effects, and it kind of goes in this circular fashion, where you kind of search for evidence first. So before picking a solution, you, you kind of need to prove to yourself that that solution is like uh, better than potential other solutions, or maybe even coming up with one yourself. Then you learn from what you've done, and you, that leads to more expertise. Um, with that expertise, you either explore or exploit, and then you go back and you search for evidence again, and you try to iterate and make things better and better. And this leads to this critical, uh, critical thinking. So uh, I'll give you a couple examples of each phase of, of this kind of thinking that I like to do, and one of them is in, uh, about information cascades, which uh, essentially is what this whole talk is kind of about. Um, David Hirschleifer, a behavioral economist, uh, this is important enough, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. With many individuals with virtual certainty, a point is reached where an individual rationally ignores his own private information and bases his decision solely upon what he sees predecessors do. The accumulated evidence from predecessors outweighs his private information. The decision of this individual N is uninformative to later choosers. Thus, individual N plus one is no better informed than individual N. So she joins the cascade. And this is what happens when you just blindly copy a convention. You don't know why someone else did something. So if you see company X doing some thing, and you just copy that, you don't know what their data is, but you're ignoring your own data, and you're using that unknown data from that company, and you're adding to that information cascade, because someone else will look at your company and say, oh, they did that too, so it must be good. You know, it's, it's Google. They must do everything right, because they're Google. Why? Why is that? How do they know? This is, uh, these are three questions that Edward Tufte, um, who uh, one of my favorite champions of uh, presenting and looking for evidence. How do they know? How do I know? And how do you know? These are good questions to ask. Rather than it's just a big company that everybody knows, so they must have enough money to have researched that, and they know what they're doing. We've seen really, really, really bad design decisions made by big companies all the time. Why? Because there are people, just like us, who can make mistakes, who maybe don't do their work as, as, uh, as thoroughly as they could, just like we do. They're no different, they're no special, they're not sp more special than, than we are. Um, another uh, researcher did a case study on uh, research, research reports, and misunderstanding number one, is that general theoretical, so context-independent knowledge is more valuable than concrete, practical, context-dependent knowledge. You know more about your clients. You, you, if you have a company, you know more about your particular business than some random company that you saw on the web. And this talk is not about Airbnb. It's nothing against Airbnb. If anything, it's a compliment for the people at Airbnb who did things that other people didn't do, but now other people look to as examples. Um, but we want to be those people, if, if it's possible. They ignored some of the um, context-independent knowledge that they had, and they, they looked at their specific context, and they started working creatively within that. So constraints, really. So you can ask yourself, in what ways does Solution X apply to your scenario, and in what ways does it not? And what assumptions does, the, does that solution make? Because when you take someone else's solution, you're taking on all the baggage, whether you like it or not. Um, this is something that I found is writing about what you learned. I found this to be super valuable. And anyone like journal here or 
keep work notes or anything like that? No, a few, okay. I think this is, um, a part of design is writing. I think uh, um, Carolyn's talk was very interesting because documentation, you can document just about anything and no one even has to read that documentation. You could write documentation for yourself and it can help sort out your thoughts uh, in a way. Um, one way you, to do that is to kind of keep a notes archive. So any new thing that you learn, uh, designers have uh, what we traditionally call a uh, morgue file, which is any images that we found interesting. We'd put it in the morgue, morgue file, and um, you could kind of consult that when it's kind of like a um, living mood board, but it's not on a board. It's just kind of a, a file or a, a bucket or whatever it is, a uh, wall. Um, but a notes archive, if you, nowadays, we have all these tools and you can, you can tag things and you can, get, um, you can get relevant notes and you can combine ideas that you didn't even know that would be related ideas. You might not have even remembered that you had those ideas. So a notes archive can be really useful. And um, there's a uh, sociologist, uh, he, a late sociologist, uh, anyone know this person, Niklas Luhmann? Yeah? He, he's famous for the, the notes that he took on these little uh, slip, slips of, uh, I guess, kind of index card-like uh, papers and put them in this thing. And he had this elaborate system of being able to keep track of uh, relationships between different notes that he'd made. And he wrote, I think, 70 books in a 30-year period while at the same time coming up with a, a theory of society, which took him 29 years to, to write. He, he estimated it would take 30 years. He was uh, early by one year. So <laughs> amazing. And he wrote like uh, hundreds and hundreds of articles all in that same period of time. And he did it by taking notes on everything that he learned that he thought might be relevant to him in the future and figuring out how these things link together. Now, we don't have to do this, <laughs> luckily. That's like crazy. But... Um, we have tools, you know, just a text editor or something like, like the archive where you can um, tag things and ID them and, and connect them in, in whatever ways you like. And it's kind of like a wiki, but it's not, not quite a wiki. Um, I just do it in my text editor and I'm able to tag things and I have a plugin that kind of connects these things. And that's how this talk kind of developed was that I, I tended to have, I was looking through my notes and I had all these notes that seemed to have these kind of relationships. And, um, um, kind of pulled them together and, and then kind of came up w with this. And so that's really, really useful. Um, an example of exploring, exploiting, exploiting, when do you explore new ideas and when do you go with something that's like a convention that, that you know will, will work? Um, anyone read this book, Algorithms to Live By? Did you like it? Yeah. Eh, yeah. Explore, exploit, yeah. It, it was a fun book. Um, you know, I wouldn't live by these algorithms, but one of them is explore and exploit. And basically, the most valuable thing is this, right? Would you agree with that, Jeremy? The, if you have more time, you explore. If you have less time, you exploit. Now, the danger here is that none of us have any time. <laughs> and that you're gonna say, oh yeah, we have to use things that already exist because we have no time. So you have to really push and try to see if you can stretch the time that you have. Um, but you'll feel it when you're able to explore and when you're not. But that's, uh, that's a, a way to, to do that. And when you explore, I recommend doing zero-based uh, first principles thinking. So start as if you had no, uh, there's no prior art, you know, there's no baggage that you have um, carried along with you. So I, re I read this story a while back, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna get it completely correct, but Elon Musk wanted to build a rocket, and he wanted to build maybe 10 rockets. So he's like, uh, well, well, I'll buy them. I'll buy uh, these 10 rockets, I, I need them. And then uh, they're expensive, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> rockets cost a lot of money. So he's like, well, you know, let me see what would it cost if I just had all the raw materials and we just built one of these. And it turned out that it was like a tenth cheaper. So he could do 10 for the price of one. Um, and so he did that. So by, by going back to this idea of, okay, let's just start from scratch and see what we could do there. Um, you know, he was able to get this rocket built. So that, that can help, and we don't, have, we don't even have to build rockets, we have to you know, build a website, so it's not, not quite as hard. 
Um, and then after that, how did your solution work? How didn't it work? What did you learn from it? You document that, um, you find more evidence, and then you start the entire cycle again. So this, kind of, this process implies that you're never really done. And uh, I think that's true, at least as designers. As artists, maybe you're, you're done. You know, that's a moment in time. Uh, but we can always learn and then improve uh, the next time around. I mentioned that I studied uh, art and design in college, and uh, so I painted a lot. I spent most of my time in the studio. It was uh, hard work for four years doing a double major like that. And at one point, we had to show our work. And so this committee of art professors comes in, and they have to, um, they have to give you this you know, in your last year, they have to um, consult with each other and look at your work and then uh, kind of give you advice and see if you passed, basically. <laughs> and uh, I hung up all my, uh, my, my canvases and, and a lot of drawings, and I, I tended to have pretty large canvases, so, um, you know, it took up a lot of space, and this whole room was filled with, with stuff that I'd made. And they came in, I was really, really nervous. And... Uh, then they looked around and they said, okay, you can, you can step out. And so I stood in the hallway, uh, again, really nervous and waiting. And about 10 minutes later, they came out and they told me to come back in. And then they told me something that uh, kind of freaked me out. Because um, I, I kind of expected uh, to hear that my work was really, really good. I had heard that for four years, that I, I always could draw really well and um, people are always saying you're great at art and drawing and everything. And so I expected that, but that's not what I got. What they said is that you're only thinking about your own work. You're thinking about not your own work, but you're just thinking about the work. You're thinking about art. You look at art. You talk about art. Uh, you read about art. You make art. That's it. And the danger with that is that it becomes shallow. You're kind of, it's almost like a, a cannibalism happening. You're just looking into your own bubble and you're not looking outside of it. And that's not where creativity generally comes from. So they, they told me that you have uh, one assignment because your work is good, but you have one assignment. You have to go read this. This is a book, a uh, collection of essays written in 1960 by Ben Sean, uh, who was an artist. Um, originally uh, I, a Lithuanian, I want to say, but uh, he wrote, uh, one of these essays was called The Education of an Artist, and his premise was that uh, you need to be curious, and we heard a little bit about curiosity yesterday, and there are basically three conditions that you need to, to have to be a good artist, to be cultured, to be educated, and to be integrated, and these things, he recommended that to get these three, he recommended a, a whole bunch of things. So it was almost like someone um, talking to their child <laughs> when you read this essay. It's like you should go to one art school, but you, not one, but two or three, and you should uh, go move somewhere else. And uh, th basically what, it, what he was saying is you need to go out and experience life, and you need to look at things that are outside of your particular area of expertise, because that's where your inspiration will come from. You'll come up with the craziest things when you look outside of, of what we do. Some of my biggest success um, uh, in the past in my career, the, which culminated in the book that I wrote, was based on me looking at all the things that developers do to make their lives easier. And why can't we do that as designers? And that juxtaposition, those things that seem unrelated, but we somehow pull them together and make them related, that uh, makes something special that, that's slightly unlike anyone else um, has done. So whenever someone asks you to follow a certain convention, then you just ask, challenge them. Get, you know, get some evidence. Say, well, you know, what problem are you solving? How do you know that will work? Ask toughies in question, uh, important questions. How do you know? How do they know? Think, be critical of what I'm saying. How do I know? So this is the important thing, I think, is to keep learning. You'll sidestep simple choosing. Um, you'll follow the harder path, uh, but more rewarding path of critical thinking. And I think that everyone here in this room, and I don't think it, I, I want to say I know it, but I have to look for evidence. <laughs> but everyone in this room, everyone's been brought up differently. You've had different backgrounds. 
Uh, you do different work. You see things differently. So there's something unique there, and you could bring it into your work. It doesn't have to be the same as everybody else's work. And that potentially everyone in this room can do fantastic things just by tapping into that uniqueness of who you are and being using that to be critical or maybe change the conventions that are out there and then make your own thing of it. And as, as David said yesterday, uh, I'll end with his quote, you've got to be open for the unexpected. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.